better. Please over now and uh, may God bless you. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to join God's people once more in the study of his word and in prayer. Uh, it's a great blessing. And today, as you know, we are continuing our study of the word of God. And uh, the theme of this week's series is Grace Galore. Grace Galore. Grace in profusion. Grace that is incalculably great and immeasurably, you know, uh, huge. We give God the opportunity that we are studying for this week, uh, the book of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. This amazing passage of scripture teaches us these amazing things about the amazing grace of God by which we are saved. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10, uh, of course, uh, open before us the amazing truth that first of all, we are saved by grace. We also learn from this text that we are saved through faith. We are saved as a gift. We are saved not of works. We are saved for God and we are saved unto good works. Dear friends, Yesterday, we learned the pipeline of saving faith. The pipeline of saving faith. Uh, that was an amazing study as our focus was only on two words in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Two words. And those words were um, through faith. Through faith, uh, we learned in our study that we are saved through the instrumentality of faith in Christ. The instrumentality of faith in Christ. And uh, of course, we learned that the faith by which we are saved is uh, you know, faith that is anchored on Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And um, of course, we learn some amazing things about that faith uh, by which we are saved. Uh, and uh, some of the truths that we picked up uh, from our study on yesterday as we consider faith uh, very clearly as a pipeline or an instrument through which we are saved. Uh, some of the things we picked up uh, uh, include, number one, the, 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 the origin of saving faith. And we learned that faith comes from God. Uh, the Bible says, looking onto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We also learned about the object of saving faith. On whom should our faith be anchored or directed? We learned that we must have faith in God. We must have faith in the Son of God. And we must have faith, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we learned about the organization of saving faith. We said that there are three aspects of uh, the faith that saves. And those aspects are content. What it is that we should believe uh, about the gospel. We should believe the content of the gospel. That Jesus died for our sins and he rose the third day for our justification. We said the next component is consent. Uh, we are to believe that what we have heard is true. Uh, we are to agree uh, that the content is correct. And finally, we said commitment is the third uh, 
component or aspect of saving faith. And this is complete uh, trust in God, complete hope in God that is manifested in total commitment or total surrender, total trust, total hope, and total obedience to God. And then we talked about the outcome of saving faith. We said, if you have this faith, this absolute trust in God, uh, the result will be justification, reconciliation, sanctification, glorification. You will experience these amazing things uh, that God works in us and through us. Hallelujah to his name. We had to do that summary because of the technical glitch uh, that we encountered on yesterday. Our study today continues and our text for consideration uh, is uh, of course from the book of Ephesians. And today we are looking at Ephesians chapter two, verse number eight. Again, uh, Ephesians chapter two, verse number eight. And we will also look at verse number nine. Uh, so shall we read the word of God together? The Bible says, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Our study today is titled, The Pollution of Men's Self-Saving Works. The Pollution of Men's Self-Saving Works. Let us pray. Eternal Father, thank you for the privilege of Bible study. We ask that the Holy Spirit who inspired your word in its entirety will illuminate Ephesians chapter two, verses eight and nine, and give us insight for living. And as it has pleased you, O God, to use a frail, a filthy, and a feeble vessel as myself, I do not ask for mighty words of human wisdom to move the audience. All I ask now, O oh Lord, is that humanity will diminish and that divinity will dominate as you speak to us pointedly, powerfully, and personally in the name of Jesus Christ. My friends, we're looking at the pollution of men's self-saving works. And I hope you know very well that I believe in the sufficiency of the Bible. I believe in the supremacy of the Bible and the summation of the Bible. So with this, you know, affirmation of what I believe about the Bible, we will now look at the text together. Ephesians chapter two, verses eight and nine. The text says, for by grace, you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. Eight is the gift of God. It has been a troubling, you know, uh, 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 journey of many students of the Bible to find the antecedent of the pronouns that and eight. That and eight. Now look at the text again. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Eight is the gift of God. To which of the nouns, you know, does uh, the pronoun that refer to, or does the pronoun eight refer back to? Is it grace or is it faith? Or is it the entire, you know, preceding portion of the, ver the, 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 the verse? Friends, there has been debates on the possible, you know, antecedent because understanding the antecedent will eventually give us an understanding of uh, what the text is really talking about. And so in approaching uh, this task, 
of finding out the antecedent, or one needs to consider two things. Number one, the immediate context. And you know that as we studied on the first day, Ephesians chapter two, verses one to 10, the context of the passage is salvation. And uh, uh, therefore the context and, and the structure of the first phrase of the passage tend to look at the subject of salvation. That's the first thing. The second thing one must consider is the grammatical gender, the grammatical gender of uh, the, the, the nouns used in this text and the pronouns that are used here as well. Uh, for instance, uh, the Greek syntax matches gender of pronouns to the antecedent it refers to. So look at the text with me, please. Uh, the word grace used here has a grammatical gender of feminine in the Greek. And faith has the grammatical gender of feminine in the Greek. And that, which is, which is the pronoun, has a grammatical gender of neuter in the Greek. So if that or, or, or this referred to the, uh, either grace or to faith individually, it should be in the feminine gender because uh, I believe, uh, as, as you know, Greek syntax, you know, suggests that uh, pronoun and antecedent must agree in gender. Unfortunately, this is not the case. However, let me show you the most uh, possible option. That is, the neuter gender is used uh, for the pronoun in this text. And this is the common gender used when a phrase or a clause is the antecedent. Uh, you hope you're hearing me now that when a phrase or a clause is the antecedent, usually the neuter gender is employed. Therefore, uh, it is more plausible to believe that this uh, that is used in the text or eight used in the text refer to the whole previous clause. And what is the previous clause? For by grace, you have been saved through faith. Look at the preceding clause. Therefore, I believe that the message of Ephesians chapter two, verse eight is salvation in its entirety is the gift of God. Salvation in its entirety is the gift of God. The grace by which we are saved is a gift of God. The faith through which we are saved is the gift of God. And so friends, we are going to look at a couple of things in this text today. First of all, we will see, having set, you know, the grammatical context, uh, we'll look at uh, verses eight and nine and consider the pollution of men's self-saving works. The pollution of men's self-saving works. If you look at world religions, brothers and sisters, you realize that salvation by work is a common, you know, practice. Uh, Zurich Trinitism uh, believed that a person has to win the struggle over evil. Judaism say you must obey the Jewish law and custom. Islam says you must practice the five pillars successfully. Hinduism says the individual must purify himself from evil in life and after life. And then um, uh, uh, Sakhism says a proper worship and conduct must be performed in order to be worthy to be saved. Confucianism uh, says that heaven on earth is possible, but only through personal conformity to the rules of society. And Shantoism says we must maintain Japanese supremacy at all costs. And paganism says we must appease the gods and spirits in order to be rewarded. These are all, you know, religions that push forward salvation 
by works. But look at what our text says. Our text comes across as a condemnation of men's self-saving works. The text says, not of yourselves, not of yourselves. So you are saved by grace through faith and that not of yourselves. This salvation which comes by grace through faith is not of yourselves. Brothers and sisters, God ought rightly condemns men's effort to save himself. And the reason for this condemnation, the reason for this repute, uh, refutation, uh, God is refuting any approach to save oneself by works. And the reason is self-salvation is futile. The Bible says in Genesis 3, verse number 7, and then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed thick leaves together and made it themselves covering. This is the human effort of Adam and Eve to cover their nakedness, which was induced by sin. Uh, but God said, that's not sufficient, friends. You need another covering. And so in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, the Bible says, also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tonics of skin and clothed them. You don't need your own covering. You need a covering of Yahweh. You need the covering of God. You need the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, brothers and sisters, I need to know also that the reason why God condemns men's self-saving works is sinners are depraved. Sinners are depraved. They are incapable of saving themselves. They are inextricably and extremely, you know, uh, 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 depraved. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter uh, 5, verse 29, all that they had such a heart in them. In other words, God is saying the human being does not have the natural propensity to fear God or, or to keep his commandments because he's depraved. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 13, verse number 20. Three, the Bible says, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard, its spots? Then may you also do good who are accustomed to do evil. Uh, friends, we are, you know, continually, you know, evil in our inclinations. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of uh, the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. This is the depravity of humanity. Genesis chapter 8, verse 21, the Bible says that the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. So man is depraved. Humanity is depraved. One more text to prove this point. Jeremiah 17, verse 9, the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So yes, we cannot save ourselves because we are depraved. Now look at the text, what is going on here. The text says in verse nine, not of works, not of works. So God is condemning not just, you know, self-saving uh, uh, works in terms of not ourselves, not from within ourselves, as that text can be translated. It's also not of works. If, if you look at the Greek, you can literally translate this expression as absolutely not out of you know, works, not as a result of work, okay? Uh, not out of work. In other words, uh, not out of a source of works, not out of a source of works, not produced by man, nor earned 
by man is what the text is actually telling us. So what do we learn from this? We are learning, friends, that works cannot justify us. We cannot be justified by works. Uh, Romans chapter 3, verses 19 to 20, the Bible says, not now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Look at verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. And Romans chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, the Bible says, Who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly? His faith is accounted for righteousness. So works cannot justify us, friends. Works cannot justify us. Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, the Bible says, We are not justified, or knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified before God. Friends, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, the Bible says, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus. In the book of Titus chapter 3, verse number 5, the Bible says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. So we are not saved by works. In fact, the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, that we are all as an unclean things and our righteousness are as filthy rags. Uh, what does this mean, friend? That expression, filthy rags, is quite strong because in the Hebrew, the word filthy is a translation of the Hebrew word ada which literally means the bodily fluids from a woman's menstrual cycle. Now, the word rags is a translation of beged, meaning a rag or garment. Uh, therefore, these righteous acts of ours outside of Christ are considered by God as repugnant, as a soiled female hygiene product. On our own, our righteousness is simply self-righteousness and vain. It's hypocritical religion. And this type of religion produces nothing more than filthy rags. And friends, this reminds me of a man who ran to a crusade. Uh, but when he arrived, he saw the people uh, putting together the tent. They, 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 I mean, dismantling the tent because the crusade had ended. And so this man said, oh, what can I do in order, you know, to, to be saved? Uh, the, the crusade is over, so what can I do? And one of the workmen said to this man, you can't do anything. It's too late for you. And then uh, horrified, the man said, what do you mean? How can it be too late for me? How can you say I cannot do anything uh, for my salvation now? And then one of the workmen responded saying, the work has already been accomplished. There is nothing you need to do but believe it. You need to believe that Jesus died for your sins and he rose the third day for your justification and you will be saved. I love what D.L. Moody said once. He said the thief had nails through his both hands so that he could not work. And it nailed through each of his, you know, foot so that he could not run errands for the Lord. He could not lift a hand or foot toward his salvation. And yet Christ offered him the gift of God and he took it. Christ now threw him a passport and that was to take him into paradise. Salvation is not by works, brothers and sisters. Not by works, not by works, not by works. And now look at it. 
God condemns men's self-saving works. But in a text, there is something else God does as we wrap up. He condemns men's self-congratulating words. He condemns men's self-congratulating words. He says, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Uh, that's a powerful statement there. He says, he doesn't want anyone to glory. He doesn't want anyone to boast. The, the word boast there actually is a powerful word. It has the idea of taking pride in something uh, in a good or legitimate sense. Okay, the word boast there suggests the outward expression of inward pride. And God says he doesn't want anyone to boast uh, for salvation. He doesn't want anyone to boast. And why is Paul using this word boast? Because boasting was a common, you know, practice among the Jewish people and the Gentiles. And so Paul said for salvation, I don't want any Jew to be boastful. Yes, because the Jewish people are boastful. The Bible says in Romans chapter 2, verse 17, indeed, you are called a Jew and you rest on the law and you make your boast in God. What he's saying is that the Jewish people have claimed monopoly over God as if he were their personal property and they boasted that they had God as their God. But Paul is saying that for salvation, he doesn't want the Jewish people to boast because it is not of works, least any man should boast. And he also knew that the Gentiles were boastful. He doesn't want the Gentiles to boast as well. In Romans chapter 11, verse 18, he says, do not boast against the branches. The Gentiles said that God was done with the Jewish people and they were the ones that God was now working with. And Paul says, no, don't do that. Don't boast against the branches. Uh, the point that he is making is God saved us by grace alone so that no man will boast. So that no one will boast. And as we close this message, let me remind you of the story of the man who was boastful in the Bible. Luke chapter 18, verses 10 to 14, the Bible tells the story of two worshipers. One of them was a Pharisee. He was a religious leader. Today we will say he was a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. This man goes to church and he lifts up his head in arrogance and boastfulness. He's a bravado. And he, as a bravado, began to say to God, I thank you that I am not like other men. I'm not an extortioner. I'm not unjust. I'm not an adulterer. And I am not like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all of my earnings or my possessions. Uh, brothers and sisters, then the Bible says that the tax collector, on the other hand, another worshiper in the same service, he could not even lift up his head to heaven, but he bowed his head down and beat upon his breast. And he said, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. And Jesus, in the end stress of this parable, in, in, in the Bible, in verse 14, the Bible says, this man, the man who was not boastful, the man who was not boastful, the man who recognizes insufficiency and his sinfulness, this man, he went home more justified. The Bible uses the word justified rather than the other. Why was he justified? Because he relied on the merits of the cross. Galatians chapter 6 verse 14, the Bible says, But God forbid that I should boast, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. The song says, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died, my richest gain I count but loss. 
and pour contempt on all my pride. And I let the stanza that says, forbade it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the cross of Christ, my God. All the vain things that charmed me most, I sacrificed them to his blood. As we close today, listen to the words of Ellen White. Oh, that all may see that everything in obedience, in penitence, in praise, and thanksgiving must be placed upon the altar, the glowing fire of the righteousness of Christ. All things, everything, our obedience, our penitence or repentance, our praise, our thanksgiving must be placed upon the glowing fire of the righteousness of Christ Jesus. Let us pray. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, the Savior rush like get it. Once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. We acknowledge today with all sincerity of heart that nothing in us and about us could have earned us favor with God. The word says, how can a man be just with God? Oh God, 